This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of hit studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a hit business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the hit industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your hit business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the hit revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your hit business with Imagine Strength. So Lauren Snell here and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hit business and fueling your passion for high intensity training. Please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Takes less than 10 seconds and really helps the podcast grow and help more people learn about hit and of course, build a successful hit business. Secondly, get more clients for your high intensity training business when you download our free anti-aging and strength training sales presentation. You can use this for your next speaking engagement or client seminar to help you convert more customers and retain more clients for your business. You can download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash free, that's F-R-E-E. You'll also get access to our free hit business resources, which includes short PDFs on how to attract great personal trainers, 10 tips to get more clients, and much, much more. You can download that again over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash free, that's F-R-E-E. This is episode 417. And this podcast is all about the one and done protocol with John Little. John Little is the owner of Nautilus North Strength and Fitness Center in Bracebridge, Ontario. He is an accomplished author in the field of exercise, philosophy, history, and martial arts. John's articles have been published in every major fitness and martial arts magazine in North America. And he has produced, at this point, I'm sure, well over 40 publications. You can also check out John's hit uni course, John Little's six-minute hit and get 10% off when you go to hituni.com and use the coupon code HIB, it's high intensity business, HIB10 during checkout. John, great to be with you as always. Great to see you again, Lawrence. Wow, I think we were just calculating a couple of years since we spoke. It's been, that's right, year and a half, and always grateful for your time. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And it's a bit different to be recording a, a podcast you know, 8.20 p.m. my time on a Saturday evening. So we have a, oh. an old speckled hen on the go just to uh, right. fit, fit, <laughs> fit the mood. <laughs> Dog barking momentarily because someone is dropping something off at our door. I apologize if this happens. Uh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Extra, extra ambience for the podcast. So um, <laughs> as we were sort of uh, saying in the build-up, um, there's no resources out there, well, that I can find, John. Um, on the one and done protocol. And yet, so many people have reached out to me to say, will you talk to John Little about the one and done protocol? Because I'd love to learn more about it. Um, and as you said to me in the, uh, the build up to this, this could be a five minute podcast, but <laughs> um, but we're, we're, we're quite good at making this much longer than that. Um, so let's um, let's kick off with definitions, John. What is the, uh, the one and done protocol exactly? Well, uh, the one I've done was sort of uh, my Ken Hutchins super slow. Um, it, it had been argued by uh, super slow theorists that you had to move slowly. Slowly was better, and the reasons they gave were uh, safer. It was there was less force. Um, you would only perform 
three to five repetitions typically. Uh, and then you reach a point of momentary muscular failure in the set would terminate. And so I was looking at what they were looking for. And, you know, they wanted it to be safe. They wanted it to end up using a lighter weight to some degree when you're, when you're moving slowly. Um, and it was, it was the deep inroading, not the deep inroading technique, but a, an inroading technique whereby uh, you bumped up against the wall of muscular failure in the anaerobic pathway, 60 to 90 seconds. And I thought, well, from a wear and tear perspective, you know, when you're doing someone, let's say is doing uh, 20 reps. So they're going up and down or opening and closing a joint, let's say in squats or leg extensions, 20 times. Well, that's wear and tear because every time you open and close a joint, it's like a rope passing over the face of a rock. So there is wear and tear from rep one, rep two, rep three, rep four, and on and on and on until you reach failure. But it also dawned on me that there was wear and tear, perhaps needless wear and tear with a, a three to five rep protocol. Um, why couldn't you do it in one opening and closing of the joint? What would be required for that? And so just began experimenting. I mean, the key seemed to me to be uh, inroading, momentary muscular failure, uh, failure within the anaerobic pathways of 60 to 90, or 45 to 90 seconds. Um, and that was basically it, you know, and low force. So you didn't want to use a really heavy weight. And if you move quite slowly, you'd find that the fiber recruitment of fatigue process was such that you you were in about 45 seconds to a minute. Uh, you just, you didn't have more. You couldn't, you couldn't perform a second rep, let's say. So that was the, the genesis of done and one, you know, absolutely. I mean, apart from a static hold where there's no opening and closing of a joint, this is as close to zero as you can get for minimal wearing. So it was all about starting in your weakest position because that would require a lighter weight. So outer force would be minimal and, and moving as slowly as you could incrementally slow uh, to full contraction. And then the negative, which at that point, your muscles should be so fatigued that a weight normally would be too light for it. You'd actually recover a little bit and during the lowering was now adequate to tax you during the negative phase as well. Uh, efficiently. And when you completed that full repetition, the one rep done. So that was the birth of one and done. And, and we applied that protocol to a big three, essentially. So it was like a leg press, uh, a pull down and a chest press. And we got great results with it. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, by great, we, we hip trainers are notorious for overstating what great means. I mean, whatever the genetics person happens to be who is doing the protocol, um, they were expressed, they were realized, but uh, we didn't morph anybody uh, into a different genotype, you know, by doing it. So it was in terms of safety, in terms of the uh, cardiorespiratory benefits, in terms of the flexibility benefits, which come with the full range of motion, and the progressive resistance uh, element for strength and size and momentary muscular failure, we, I felt at least that we had a, a check mark in every box. So long answer to a short question. Now, you basically generate about 50 questions for me in that, John, which, yes. is, which is perfect. So um, there's something I just wanted to revisit. I guess one of the kind of principles or foundations of this, um, you know, you talked about you know, contractions being opening and closing of joints, running a right. rope over a rock. Is that, is that, are you describing the tendon being rubbed over bone and ligaments well, being rubbed over bone? Is it? Well, it's, it's any type of wear and tear that you get in athletics. So yes, anything that goes and services a knee joint, you know, like certainly tendons, uh, ligaments as well, but, um, only, you know, the exercise, it, it would limit the amount of ligament involved. Um, but just, just wear and tear, you know, and I mean, it's, we think back, I always tend to look at things in a macro perspective, um, let's say it's a high school or university, those, 
uh, friends, perhaps, who were on varsity level sports teams uh, and had, you know, probably a practice every day, every day of the week, maybe one or two games on the weekend, whether it was English football or it was North American football or ice hockey or what have you. Um, I don't know a soul that did that at that level, at that volume that hasn't had knee replacement surgery or hip replacement surgery. So that's, that's just wear and tear. That's what it is. And the more you do, the greater the wear and tear. So, you know, even if I uh, am ignorant, which I don't am of all of the uh, elements involved in a wear and tear issue, in the large, there clearly is wear and tear involved with simply opening and closing joints repeatedly uh, as athletes do, and as a lot of trainees do. You know, you know um, firsthand, I'm sure people that are at the gym work out with up to 15, 20 sets of body part. They're pedaling a stationary bike or working on a treadmill on their off days. Maybe they're hiking. Uh, any one of these things, hiking can be enjoyable, but don't, you know, there's no denying that there's wear and tear involved here. So, you know, up until uh, your cells stop regenerating, at a rapid rate, which, uh, you know, for most people, I would, it would be in their mid twenties. Uh, they don't turn over the turnover quite as rapid as it was when we were younger. When you're younger, you can tolerate that, you know, we're running and skipping and jumping and playing and doing all this stuff. And we're getting bigger and stronger every year is part and parcel of the growth process. But, um, after a certain point that isn't happening. It, tissue is not regenerating at quite the rate that it once did. And that's, you know, as speaking to an older hip community, that's where you want to be a little more cautious regarding paying attention to wear and tear factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So going into this a little bit more, that makes a lot of sense what you said. Um, I'm just trying to understand, this is slightly unrelated, although it's, it's kind of related. Um, they didn't drink. Well, yeah, exactly. So I'm all, over, I'm all over the place. I mean, that, that was my 10th drink. You just saw me collect that. Um, <laughs> it's not really much. Uh, so, so, you know, so, some some individuals like hypothesize that, um, I guess you call it maybe mechanical work or number of contractions is plays a big role, potentially a role in optimizing muscular hypertrophy. Um, but it's almost like, it could, if that's true, that could be a trade-off, right? If you had too many contractions and accelerating that wear and tear process as well. I mean, you can grab them that premise that, yeah, it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say that you have to do more of these contractions to, um, to continue to progress. Well, then the wear and tear factor rises. And ultimately, it, you know, the wear and tear has, has to hit the wall first. And then... You know, you're immobilized going to the hip or the knee surgery, and then you have atrophy, and you've got to start all over again. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you look at it gain in the large, even a lot of repetitions, what is the end game of that? Fatigue to the point where growth is stimulated, fibers are recruited, exhausted, and you've done all you can to activate stimulate uh, muscle tissue. So, you know, we know, and I mean by that, you and I, from the research that we've done that you, you don't need to do it in a super high volume. You can, I mean, you can net out at the same, but there's a more efficient way by placing load on the working muscles. It, it's like if you are uh, riding a bicycle, if you're riding a bicycle on the flat, you can go for hours and maybe, maybe you will um, fatigue those muscles to the point where an adaptation will take place and so you'll, you'll have imposed the stimulus at that point, or you can ride up a steep hill and get to that point in 60 seconds. And the only difference is gravity is now pulling you down while you're pedaling yourself up the, and the muscles have to work harder than they do than when you're pedaling on the flat. So anyone who's done both of those can testify that, you know, pedaling up that steep hill, when you get to the point where you can't complete a revolution of the pedals, the, your, your chest is heaving. Uh, you know, your, your muscles are for the lactic acidosis is through the roof. And once you get off peak and walk it to the summit, you're still breathing heavily. 
as against never having any of those metabolic effects when you're riding on flat. So it, it's demanding muscular work that A, recruits a greater volume of fibers, um, and B, provides the greatest metabolic state, at least in terms of um, within a, a given unit of time. Um, so, you know, you can, you can protract it and you can, you can extend the process, but then it, it, you have to open and close those joints, maybe 30,000, 40,000 times to get to the same level that you would, if you did 60 revolution pedal going up the hill. Yeah. Just, I guess one like final question, probably on this, um, opening and closing of joints and this wear and tear issue. I'm just really curious, like what, I'm sure it's just very complicated, but what the, um. I guess threshold is for an injury to occur or damage, you know, uh, permanent damage to occur. And I'm wondering, you know, is it really, is there much difference? So let's take someone, for instance, who trains high intensity training twice a week. They do eight to 12 repetitions per exercise. So, you know, let's say they're hitting eight failure at eight, which I typically do because I hate doing loads of reps because it's brutal. <laughs> and, um, and so let's say that's 16 opening and closing roughly per exercise. Right. Let's say 10 exercises for argument's sake, that's 160 contractions, right? Um, right. Per workout. So 320 uh, a week. Now mm -hmm. compare that to one and done, which is basically, uh, is that one opening and closing of joint per exercise, right? Right. So that's right. quite significant. Do you, yeah. but that being said, if you were to then just um, extrapolate that out by 30, 40, 50 years, do you think the wear and tear is is significantly different in the former or do you think it's really when you're comparing like any hit protocol versus like like you said some like avid endurance athlete who's doing many revolutions on a bike or similar activity well mathematically it certainly is i mean right doing i mean for example at our facility we train our clients once a week so it's three opening and closings of the joint per week as a gauge pick a number you know of any other protocol any other a training approach. Um, and, and granted there will be some that can tolerate this owing to genetics and age and all these sort of factors. But, uh, if you do pay attention to things such as wear and tear, it to be on your radar that this is not a positive thing, nor a necessary thing. You can achieve the desired effect of exhausting, stimulating or recurring, stimulating and exhausting muscle fibers, which let's say is the stimulus. Um, without that, you don't, you don't need that element. So it's like looking at exercise and saying, okay, this is the good stuff we want from exercise. We want to get stronger. We want to uh, increase our lean muscle mass to what degree we can. We want to enhance our range of motion. We want to, uh, maintain at least, uh, improve if possible, our cardiovascular efficiency. Um, that's what we want. That's the good stuff. And. Against that, on the opposite side is how we acquire it. We have fatigue muscle. Okay, that's fine. But do we have to drive up wear and tear in order to get that? And if we don't, then what can we do to minimize or eradicate that so that we can get as much of the good stuff as possible with as little of the bad stuff? I hear what you're saying, but I guess what I'm trying to say is like, if one assumes that, and maybe it's not true, but that, you know, contraction volume itself does really contribute to a, muscular hypertrophy for example or other other outcomes then yeah. what, what you know that's and well, that is assumption that's by no means card yeah, stuff fine fine um but what if there what if there are no differences in the volume of you know contractions opening and closing of joints versus a super minimalist protocol like done in one is it done in one or one and done it's the call both and i'd confuse myself in <laughs> <writing it over laughs> time. Yeah. Uh, someone else said done in one. I thought, oh, I like that better. And then I called that one. But the, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. It's, you know, you can juxtapose whichever you I, I like, but I like both. Maybe we'll just interchange it as we go. Um, I'm sorry. So I, 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 I kind of like derailed my question there or my point, but <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if should be, is there really anything to be concerned about, even if the, the, the kind of quote unquote higher volume hit crowd I call that myself, I don't know. Um, who, who, yeah. you know, is there, is there really be much, much to be concerned about in terms of the overall 
uh, contraction volume. Um, you know, if, if we feel that actually that's something we want to do, go ahead. Or the murder or the chair factor, which one, which one are you? Well, I'm wondering, I them? guess I'm, 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 I'm wondering if the wear and tear factor, I mean, look, I'm, I'm 36, right? So what do I know? But I'm, I'm wondering if it really is even a factor, like where well, we'll... some that would say it's not, I think Doug McGuff might be in that, in that crowd. Cause I remember I haven't spoken a lot, but when we did, I, I got the impression that he didn't think, uh, super slow, for example, um, that, that, that the wear and tear offered by that protocol really was, uh, he, he thought it was negligible and right, uh, right. I, I tend to, res I tend to respect Doug's viewpoint. Um, and, and, it, and maybe it's not, but there still could be no denying that one opening and closing of it, right. Is less wear and tear than six, um, would be my rebuttal, I guess. Uh, so if that is a factor and it's not for everybody. You know, maybe it's not on the radar of most people. They don't really care about it, but you will care about it if it happens there. Right. Uh, I mean, I've known lots of people that come to my gym who are involved in property maintenance and we live in an area where there's a lot of cottages, you know, and so the people that own these cottages hire local people to make sure the property is okay. You know, the snow is off the roof in the winter time. Um, the, the water and the pipes underneath the cottage are good. The dock hasn't shifted. And so the, there is a lot of crawling around on hands and knees, bending, twisting, and uh, going into the water and moving cribs on rock, all this sort of stuff. They have knee replacements. They have shoulder replacements because it's daily wear and tear. So it is a factor. Now, yeah, it could be... Yeah, People might think, well, you're making mountain out of a molehill. You know, it's a, it's a minor issue, especially in the high intensity circles. And that's true. Um, but it's still, it, there's no denying that, that opening and closing a joint is wear and tear. And if you can tolerate it better than somebody else, well, then you have my wishes. That's great. But I just thought, you know, one of the reasons super slow was that it was low force and less wear and tear. And I thought, well, can we improve upon that? And in my opinion, theoretically, one and done is an improvement upon that. There, were th there are those who strongly disagree with that, story. but, um, you know, certainly viewed from the large, um, I think it's an accurate thing, but I've been wrong before. <laughs> no, I, I thank you. That was really interesting. So. Are you doing, is done in one, your go-to protocol at the studio? Did I hear that right? Okay. No, it's just a protocol. Right. And it, it was done almost as a reflex reaction to the super, we, I just finished body by side. So my mind was in that, um, mode of low force, low wear and tear. And I just, I thought, well, can, can you get the same effect? You can certainly do it in the same time frame. And the big thing that said was term under load. How long are the muscles on? And this is the optimal time that they should be under load. Well, that being the case, I knew who you could do a static protocol and achieve the desired effect. So why couldn't you do a dynamic protocol if you take the element of moving slowly to its logical conclusion? And, and that was the done one protocol. And he did it. I mean, when we were experimenting with it, we, as the house protocol for a while, because I wanted to get as much feedback on it as possible. And, uh, it, it results were the equal of super slow. Uh, it, I wouldn't say the equal of, um, uh, max contraction only because they're harder to quantify. Max contraction, the weights went up every single workout. So it was like, it was evident that something big was going on here. Uh, with done in one, the weights went up, but because they are operating out of their weakest range of motion, they were micro in increases, but they were still significant, you know, and, and the effect, the effect was every bit as profound as, uh, a uh, man's interaction was, or, or super slow was used it. Yeah. Um, but, but to me, I mean, when I wrote, um, the time savers workout, I, I was of the opinion that, uh, 
body adapts very quickly to a given protocol. I think we discussed this prior uh, discussion. Uh, therefore, it wasn't a bad idea to change protocols uh, every so often. Yeah. So, you know, once that realization occurred, then down in one became just another color in your paint box. It, you know, go to it. It's a good protocol, safe protocol, low wear and tear protocol. But, you know, don't uh, light a can before it's old. It's not, there's nothing, you know, intrinsically superior about it as a protocol. Um, so, I mean, really, in truth, to answer your question, at Nautilus North, the house protocol is to warm and Watkins, which is actually sets a 10, you know, with this heresy and the high intensity work. <laughs> it, to me, it's the most established protocol. It was created by two exercise physiologists. It had a great track record of rehabilitating uh, wounded soldiers. And, it, and also in their book on the protocol, they said, eh, first two sets really aren't that important. You could do one set. Um, so, you know, tip of the hat, we like to think in the high intensity world, um, we who have, let's say, innovated protocols that were so far beyond our predecessors, you know, in terms of knowledge and we're really not, you know, we're footnotes to what they did. They broke the ground. And, um, but we're, we're a species that gets more at varieties. I told you, this is all you need to do done in one. You don't need to do any other protocol. You might accept that. And if you're a real, a real zealot, you'd accept it for about six months. And then you'd just be saying, I got something else. It's, it's monotonous. You know? mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I remember speaking to Bill D. Simone, um, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And he, he was under the impression that I would be hostile to him because he's, he's not a hit advocate in the, uh, traditional sense. And, and he, he was a big believer. He said, we got to talking and he was saying, I think it's really important that the psyche of the trainee is married with the solo, with the protocol. I think I agree hundred percent. I'm stunned that I agreed with, him. you know, it was, but it's true. I mean, you cannot divorce the, the psyche from the soma. If I give you a protocol that is absolutely brutal, but it's very effective, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. So again, you have to take that same approach where I, you look at, this is the good we want. This is the bad that, uh, from the client's perspective that, uh, is required to achieve that. You have to look at the other side of the ledger this time and say, how much of the bad could we manipulate to make it palatable to the client and still maintain as much of this good stuff as we can. Um, so it's, you know, it's a bit of a moving target, but when you, when you take the genetic factor that comes in, in terms of our ultimate response to exercise and tolerance of exercise, as Mencia pointed out, and recovery ability. Um, you, you have to make allowances for the individuation in the, in the, in the protocol. We, you know, we like cause and effect. We like strict rules. We like laws uh, that will be applied. And therefore there should be no deviation and no reason for deviation. But you're dealing with it with an organism. You're not dealing with a gene here. And um, I often say to my clients, it's the sum, it's the soy. You know, you've got to, you could, you know, plant a, a lovely rose bush in the middle of the Sahara, but it's not going to grow. You know, even though it's got lots of sunlight, it doesn't have the soil, it doesn't have the genetic components in that to the nutritive component even. Um, to realize its, its potential that, so, uh, you know, the genetic factor is a big one and, and it always comes up to challenge us when we try to get too dogmatic, you know, and, and well, it should. Yeah, very much so. Um, can you, I, I think you did, you did give us like a quick overview there of one and done, um, a workout session. So you said big free typically. So like a leg press, pull down, chest press, is that right? So you cool, right? Um, do it with any exercise. I mean, so you of have, uh, we, I, I, I tend to favor, uh, compound movements just because I have no desire to be in the gym. Uh, even though I, I'm in there every day, I don't want to work out every day. Uh, I find that I get the most metabolic bang for the buck, uh, doing, uh, a big three. So right. Yeah. 
That's yeah. That's our. It's so funny. Um, all the time, you know, our, our our process. Like if a client's late, if they're like, if if they've got. So you know, I run a studio here now, John, uh, in Galway. I don't know if you knew that. Um, oh, I did. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, so if a client's late, um, it's the big free all day long. Yes. Yeah. It's that's all it is. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's a good it's a, a protocol. I mean, it, yeah. it, it does justice to most of the major muscle groups. So yeah. uh, that's okay by me. And the older I get, you know, I don't get as hung up on, uh, uh, geez, I got to work my brachialis and the soleus and the this and that. Yeah. I don't really care. <laughs> um, and also another thing is like uh, every Tuesday we do like a, a meeting with the team, like the trainers. And um, yeah. we always run over and we always uh, get to the workout. So we do the workouts afterwards and we're like, oh, we've only got, you know, half an hour and it's, you know, we need to train each other. So then we just get straight to like, you know, because our workouts would normally be like 30 minutes, like eight to 10 exercises, something right. like that. So we'll just go, right, big free? Yeah, okay, big free. And then... um. I'll throw in different protocols that we learn from people like you, people like uh, companies like Discover Strength and so on that we can practice in those sessions to then obviously uh, use with clients. And um, one of the things we were doing recently is, uh, which I learned from Discover Strength, is um, 30, 30, 30 oh, protocol, which, yeah. which is very similar, right, to one and done. It's, I mean, it's the it's same thing. It's just with a 30-second yeah. hold. Or or it. It. Yeah, it's starting and finish. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's another one with that protocol. It's uh, it's uh, one and a half and done, basically. <laughs> but yeah, so you're because, like you said, there in one and done. Let's take a, you know, if I'm doing an overhead press for those on YouTube for a second, yeah, you're, you're starting in the weakest position, and you're yeah. coming up in approximately thirty seconds. I mean, you didn't set a timer. You're going as slow as you can, right? You get to the top of the range of motion, you reverse direction, and again, you're coming down. Obviously, I'm going far. You much slower than that. Um, yes. But then just so I understand this right, so I'm on the negative. I'm coming down real slow like this, yeah. you know, and I come all the way down into that bottom position. Now, do I cease the exercise or do I attempt the positive? Because I should I, be a failure. Then, we, right? we always attempt the positive, yeah, because sometimes right. you can miss. And maybe you've got stronger since last week. And there have been times where, you know, a done in one becomes a done in two, you know, and that, uh, that, that occurs. Um, depending on, on the adaptation from the previous workout. Yeah. The key really is just going to the point where you cannot sustain the contraction. Uh, and, you know, you're familiar with the study where it, just, it indicated that, um, you know, you can do, I, th I think it was three sets of five to six reps or, or, or three sets of to 30, but as long as you had failure, the split was hit. Yeah. So. When I first came out with Donna One, I got a lot of blowback from uh, super slow people. Was like, of course you did. <laughs> three minute, three minute leg press. Oh, that's, that's going to do anything, you know. And uh, to me, it was like it's if you hit failure, hit failure. Yeah, I may have misjudged the weight, uh, but I won't next time. But but I'm also not hung up on it. It's like if it's sixty seconds, it's great. If I end up doing a second rep, then it's a second rep. But I'll take it as deep as I can. And, uh, and for people who have, it seems to me, again, from a macro viewpoint, that if you are more of a distance runner than a sprinter, it, it, probably better weight for you is one that's going to take you over 60 to 90 seconds. Do justice to the preponderance of slow twitch firing that you have. Um, but that's just speculation on my part. But it's, again, there is this, um, this tendency um, to slip in dogma in high intensity training. And the other thing that I mean, probably should be addressed is the fact that, uh, a lot of high intensity trainers like to pass themselves off as you know, so knowledgeable of the human body in Toto that they are the equal of probably, you know, an orthopedic surgeon and we are not, you know, we. And when it comes down to, if you really want to get fancy and have a little idle after your name, you're an MCT, you're a muscular contraction therapist, that's where it stops. You know, when it goes to feeling muscle, you may know a little bit, but you don't know as much as, that's why medicine specializes. There's people yeah. that know so much data that, we, I mean, we don't have years in our lives to become a specialist in every field 
relating to the human body and how it responds to various stimuli. Um, we, we know training and we know uh, that a certain level of effort has consistently produced, we infer it produces a certain type of effect. Beyond that, uh, certainly goes out the window, you know. What's interesting to me, I'd spoken, uh, are you hitting the record button here that about Mike Mentor and some of the video work that I've been doing based on his talks. And there's, there has been the, I won't say a rumor, but, but, but the charge that Mike was dogmatic and you had to do it his way. There's only one way and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, when I was going through his material, it, it occurred to me quite quickly that these people have really mischaracterized what he said. Few listened to it. Um, what he did say was, there's a spectrum, just like there is with light and, and uh, eye color and intelligence and all of these human elements, which also applies to muscle tissue. And depending on where you fall on that spectrum, you will need more or less recovery time. You will need more or less volume. But he said, the theory is universally applicable. The theory is exercise to be productive must be intense, brief, and infrequent. What does that mean? It, has to, it means it has to be intense enough to stimulate and adapt the response. It can't be performed for so long that the intensity is too low to produce that adaptive response. And you need to recover sufficiently between workouts to allow your body to produce the adaptation, the workout stimulated. That's the theory. Now, for someone to say the theory is bullshit and it's, you know, Mike Menser was dogmatic, you would have to say that the opposite is true. You don't need to train intensely enough to stimulate growth or should not. You should train with such volume that you cannot train intensely enough to stimulate an adaptive response. And what they don't wait for recovery and adaptation to take place, do it again. Uh, that clearly is not true, but the individual application, as Mike said, practical application is up to the individual trainee. And, and that to me is not dogmatic. That's like, you got to do your homework on it. Um, so, uh, you know, I take issue with the attempt to caricature Mike's position as everyone needs to do two sets once a week, hell or high water. That wasn't what he said. And yeah. the consolidated program was not forth by like to as a one that fits all for everybody this is you no know, truth it was i have some it, it's funny i was just looking at a recording today he said you know i have one i have a client he said i've been playing on the theory of high intensity training till i was blue in the face and he understands he still wants to train every day and i said well you know if you want to pay to be in the gym with you every day i have no problem with that he said he goes in the gym every day and he makes progress he said, but I had another guy. He said, and until I got him down to two to three sets once every seven to 10 days, he made no progress at all. So this is a dogmatic perspective. This is a guy that recognizes that there is a genetic spectrum of tolerance to intense exercise. And he doesn't know ahead of time where you fall into that spectrum. And so when he offered his training programs, the ideal routine, the consolidated program, they were suggested routines. It was a starting point. And if you did the ideal routine and you didn't make progress, well, okay, now you got something you can, you can manipulate, take a volume and see what that, see what happens there. You know, take an extra recovery day, see what happens there. Always, you know, with your progress chart. So you could see whether or not you're doing so resulted in a positive adaptation taking place. But as he also correctly pointed out. Um, you know, the, the dominant bodybuilding philosophy at the time was do 12 to 20 sets, uh, six days a week. But he, but if that doesn't work, where do you go? You go down to night or up to 21. You know, it's, and if it's, if you didn't, if it was 12, why would you want to start with 20? You know, it's, uh, so there's, um, but having said that they point the finger of accusation of Mike Menser as being dogmatic, but. It's the high intensity community generally that has become very dogmatic. You know, they don't allow for genetic variation of that. You're going to train twice a week. You're going to train with X amount of sets. You're going to do a certain amount of reps. 
and they're going to be done in this, in the case of super slow, they're going to be done in this tempo. Um, th there is no individual variation that is even allowed for it now in such a scenario. Today's episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your one-stop solution for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. When it comes to high-intensity training, it's about the right workout machines intelligently designed for your studio. That's the specialty of Imagine Strength. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, they've pioneered efficient and affordable fitness equipment perfectly crafted for your HIT business. With a team that lives and breathes HIT, Imagine Strength combines passion, innovation, and careful design into every piece of equipment, creating the perfect environment for an intense yet rewarding workout. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they create innovative, tailor-made equipment for HIT studios. Number two, they provide cost-efficient designs, making HIT more accessible. And number three, they're committed to continuous innovation and refinement so your studio never falls behind. Elevate your HIT business with a team at Imagine Strength. Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and select the gear that'll take your business to new heights. Be a part of the HIT revolution with Imagine Strength and see how their equipment can transform your workout experience. Yeah. You know, when you were saying about how, you know, a lot of individuals in HIT think they, they know it all. It's uh, hard from you and I, of course, because we, we know we know it all. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, this, this is, um, this, this kind of, um, Imposter syndrome is really uh, evident when I constantly speak to people like Skylar Tanner and Dr. Bryce Lee, who know much, much more than I. And, um, you know, I, it's called the, you know, you're obviously familiar with the Dunning Kruger effect. The more you learn about a subject, the more you realize how much you do not know. Yeah. And um, all this Socratic effect, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was what Socrates said that, right? All I know is that I, I don't know or that I know nothing. Right. And the more into it, it's like another universal so and then you got to start all over again so it's like you know for instance um i i, I just give an example it's like you get into high intensity training you become a trainer you start training people you start learning about pain and seeing people with pain and then you realize there's a whole category of pain so, sites so that that don't pain. Uh, they learn about pain quite a bit I say that again i said particularly when you're training clients that haven't paid you then they learn <laughs> about quite a bit <laughs> oh, that's, that's true you do you learn about tolerance yeah uh, but i guess you know pa pain science is so incredibly complex and a whole other field in terms of like how the brain produces pain all this kind of thing which is like yeah it, it's like you say it's, it's it's learning where your boundaries are and where you're ignorant and being aware of that and not you know there's nothing wrong with stopping to your ignorance either i mean we're not omniscient uh, beings so uh, and most yeah, of us but, tend quite fixated on a certain facet of uh, uh, biology, muscle tissue for most of us, right? We all, at one time in our lives, wanted to be big muscle heads. Um, so that became, that became our, our focus. And for some of us, we, we used protocol. We got maybe the best results of our lives, which in retrospect was probably pretty modest, but it did produce this market benefit. So that becomes the gold standard for a yeah. um, And I, I, you know, the, the reality is you may have gotten a similar result using another protocol. We don't know that. And again, everyone is a genetic entity, uh, different from another genetic entity that tries this. So we do know that, uh, as Mike Messer also said, physiologically, in terms of muscle physiology, we are all essentially the same. And therefore the stimulus, this is, this is speaking in the large, the same for everyone. And, you know, I venture to say that the stimulus, whatever it is, because it's all over the board, depending on the study you look at is subsumed within going to the momentary muscular failure, whether it's in road, whether it's tension, whether it's damage, it, it all seems to fit into some, uh, yeah. You know, we, we're comfortable with going to failure in terms of being a, that's a stimulus, although we do not why exactly. Just not when the studies done that they, 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 and they, they do produce uh, an adaptation. But again, the adaptation that is produced is 
contingent upon genetics, which is what makes the studies been question. Because no. who were the people? Were they good responders? Were they poor responders? I mean, at the end of the study, that's why you always see at the end of a bona fide science study, more research needs to be done. And then there's the period of time in which it's done, usually four to two weeks. That's pretty hard to draw far-reaching uh, conclusions from such a short yeah. span, you know? But uh, so like you say, we, we're learning and then we come to a point where it's like, woof, another universal. Oh my, you know, I, I, my, my pre previous learning is simply a hit post in the <laughs> next yeah. Our more knowledge, you know. So. You know, if if just to draw a line on this under this one, actually, and I think this is going to give a lot of our listeners who are running studios hope. Essentially, you can use this to your advantage. Um, and if you're honest about what you don't know, and you focus on obviously what you do, and you you plead ignorance to those things on the periphery, your clients actually going to respect you more, and actually going to probably have more confidence in you because you're not saying. Hey, I'm an expert in strength training, oh, and physiotherapy and pain science, et cetera. I'm a polymath. Right. And, and, you know, immediately that, that you know, a red flag goes up for anyone when someone says that, and uh, they're no longer going to trust that you're actually an expert at what you do. So it works in your favor to. You know, I mean, on, on the YouTube page, I have, I get a lot of questions about Mike Mentor's protocol. I, can, I focus on the macro. On it, which is yes, principles have universal application or the theory, but the practical application is worked out by the individual. Um, I had a fellow that uh, had posted and said something. In fact, well, how do you know you reach your genetic potential? Oh, hey, good question. And, you know, everyone's you know it's, that's a, that's a, especially in absentia. I don't know this guy. I don't know how far he's come. Um, yeah, and I, I. I it replied to him that, you know, when you, when you cease making progress, despite having adjusted the volume and the frequency and, you know, nothing else is forthcoming, you know, probably you bumped up against, which usually will occur for most people in one to three years, typically. Yeah. Uh, at least that's experience. And then he came back and said, oh yeah, but what about law of accommodation? You know, you gotta, you gotta change things up a little bit. And I thought, well, number one, I don't, I've never heard of this. Law of accommodation it would have been a great one to drop in my. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a law is a strong claim. <laughs> I thought, you know, that it, it, I did, some, you know, I looked it up and, and uh, it essentially said that, uh, you know, that you can, by changing the stimulus, the body adapts to the stimulus uh, that you're presenting. So you change it and then it makes another adaptation. But what I, geez, that sounds exactly like what I was saying in. Uh, time savers workout. Right. The, about conserving energy. Yeah. Uh, conservation of energy. Yeah. We could use that then. But then I was reading it and I thought, well, a law, that's a pretty strong yeah. thing. Yeah. I research this. So I, I looked for studies and I found one where they concluded that this was uh, indeed a phenomenon and they trained people upper body and legs, but only the legs made an improvement. Upper body they don't improve at all when they change. And I thought, okay, well, it's not of that. It does, it, this has to be a, the law of muscle tissue has to go right across the board. Absolutely. And so it's hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and consequently, when you factor in genetics again, what does it mean? What, what does it mean? I, I came away, of, you know, refuting my own hypothesis that it was in a, a uh, time savers workout. It was like, well, you know, there, there is, there is a change, but you can't sort of drive a higher level of adaptation is within you to develop no matter what you do. So, you know, after three years of training, and again, that's, that's my experience. You're not, you're not suddenly going to spread, you know, 10 pounds of muscle. It just doesn't happen. You switch to a different protocol or you, or now you're paleo, you know, it, it just doesn't work out. Um, yeah. Agree completely. So, um, you know, one thing I noticed talking about going back to one and done and talking about, you know, selling about doing 30, 30, 30, which is very similar. So just for those listening, 30, 30, 30 would be 30 seconds 
I know, I'm trying to think of the protocol. Let's say you're doing a pull down. 30, 30 seconds, seconds, 30 so seconds down, 30 seconds static hold, and then 30 seconds up to top. I wish oh, that's smart. Maybe I'm not familiar with it. Well, I mean, static? That, at least that's how I interpret it. What was your interpretation? I always thought it was the Darden protocol, which was uh, you start with a 30 second negative and then a 30 second positive and you finish with a 30 second negative. Oh, I see. Maybe that's it. Maybe I misinterpreted it and just made it by us. That's right. So, so what I've noticed though with this kind of super slow approach, and obviously I'm I'm quite I'm quite used to training really slow. From I used to do that, you know, when I first came across your work, Body by Science, the masterpiece. Right. Um, I was doing that for years back in London and loving it. And um, and then kind of I moved more to like I experimented with all sorts of different movement speeds and. You know, I, I like a two four. I like a two ten. I like a four four. I'm, you know, whatever. Like it for myself. Yeah. There you go. And yeah. uh, that means a case of beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I noticed with with this type of protocol, with like a one and done or a 30, 30, 30, what, what what have you, is it does take. There's a. I don't know whether it's the novelty if you've been moving slightly faster, but my God, does it take far more of concentration and uh, and discipline. And like a Zen-like focus, like it You're really, it's what meditative to, to the extreme. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, you should say that. I used to call it like a moving meditation, which is a phrase they often give to Tai Chi. But it, it was what I would do with some clients was I would blindfold. So they would go solely by, by feel hmm. while they were doing it. And I found that to be very effective. There are no distractions. It helped their focus and their mind muscle um, connection. So that was an effective means I found to get someone in a Zen, if you will, uh, yeah. mental state required to connect with the muscles for that type of protocol. So, uh, you, yeah, no, it's, it, uh, that is required. You know, you, you, and it might be one of the reasons why, um, if you do do it, maybe it, it would prove to be a little, little too much for some people. Right. Uh, and so, you know, maybe use it sparingly, use it as a change of pace, use it as, um, you know, something that you're going to use for the month of, uh, and then go back to whatever you want to do. I mean, you got, if you look at your training over the course of a year, you got 12 months, you know, and, and when you've been training more than three years, you know, like I, uh, you know, my, my genetic potential was long behind it. So I'm, I have complete, I'm completely liberated. I can do whatever the hell I want, you know, um, in my workouts and not really care. I'm not going to lose anything. And I, I'm beyond the point where I'm going to gain anything. So I train now according to what I feel like doing. Typically it's one set. I, yeah. I don't three sets and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm free to, to experiment with what that is. You know, I don't have to do it. You know, you know what, John, I reached that similar point myself that not caring when I had kids Yeah, and, and then I had the realization I'm lucky to get time to even train. <laughs> no, and again, that's, that's proper priority, right? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and with me, I have four kids, so that has long been my priority. The gym's secondary. You know, it's, it's. The people that live for the gym and, oh, I got to be in the gym or I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. Well, you know, yeah, my best wishes, but uh, there's a big world out there and there's a lot better experiences than making a weight go up and down. You know? uh, so do it as an adjunct to your life, not the reason for your life. Well said. Um, so I think you might have touched on some of this already, but um, I've got a bunch of questions here. I just want to hit one and done from all angles if possible. Does does the in terms of frequency, intensity, recovery, it's just the same, right? As any other protocol you might advocate? Uh yeah, I do. I don't know because the weights are lighter. Um that you require an extended recovery. I don't know that the damage component of the stimulus isn't as great that would necessitate a protracted recovery. And why would the weights be lighter? Because you're moving so slow, like they'd oh, be lighter starting, than a two four or something like that. Any like, lot of time, particularly during the first half, in your weakest range of motion. I see. Limited to what you can move through that. Now, 
there was a time I would have thought that would have been the worst thing you could possibly do. But in coming to understand uh, via Bill D. Simon again, uh, issues such as molinar, it doesn't mean muscles aren't producing a lot of force when you're in your weakest position. They are. Uh, they're producing maximal force in some instances. Um, and then by the time we move into your, where you have the leverage advantage, um, that weight feels a lot heavier than it is because you don't have the manpower and the firepower of a fresh muscle behind it, you know, mm -hmm. you're limited to what soldiers are left on the battlefield. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've found that, uh, if you're somebody who can recover such that can train twice a week, this is fine you'll find that you will recover adequately. If you train once a week, same thing. Um, you know, there comes a, there comes a time where even if you're training twice a week, um, you'll probably find that there's really little difference in terms of benefit by not training once a week. You know, it's just, it's going to depend on your time. It's going to depend on your preference. Again, the psyche, uh, some people just like to go and you know, uh, just get the blood circulating via training. Um, and then there's another the run. The pump, John. We got to get yeah. the pump. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's that. But it's, you know, it depends on the individual. And again, you know, to echo Mike Menser, it's the theory that is universal. The practical application is up to the individual. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. What uh, precautions, if any, should a person take before starting the one and done workout routine, um, particularly if they're new to HIT? You mean like warm ups and things like that? Yeah, and and obviously I might know the answer to this, but you know, for those who don't know. Oh uh, well, I mean the cool thing about what one and done or done and one or whatever the hell we're going to call it uh, is that you really don't need a lot of uh, preparatory activity. You're starting with a very lightweight. You're moving incredibly slowly. Um, and the weight isn't going to get heavier. It may feel heavier, but it's not going to get heavier. So I've never had an issue where people couldn't just come in off the street and start the work. Uh, it's perfectly safe. Um, again, the, the wear and tear is minimal. Uh, depending on the equipment you use, the, the stress on the joint angle is minimal. Um, and it's very thorough, you know, and it, it is performed through a full range of motion, which will optimize whatever flexibility and range of motion, uh, you have, it is a uh, progressive resistance. So it will make you stronger and bigger to what degree it can be. And if you don't, uh, you know, lollygag in between exercises, you'll keep an elevated pulse rate and you'll get some cardiovascular benefit from it. So there's no, uh. No special precaution. I mean, a, a, unless someone comes into it with an injury. And then, of course, it's the trainer's job to select an exercise that is not going to exacerbate the, the current, you know, fragility of a, of a joint or a, or a muscle or something. Well, on that point, I was wondering, actually, this could be a really good rehab protocol, potentially, because you're using a lighter weight and you're yeah. moving even slower. So mitigating injury risk, reducing the forces. Um, right. And it's very thorough in terms of activating all those fibers that you need to right. or, uh, that have atrophied, you know, and you want to involve them, give the body a reason to bring them back, you know, to, to their peak strength and size. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you spoke about seeing some really good results for this protocol. Um, I'd love for you to elaborate. Can you talk about what does that mean in terms of results? Was it increases in strength? Did you measure body composition? Anything you could talk about there? Well. When we started doing it, we still had the bod pod. So yeah, we would see increases in lead. Um, I would say, I mean, our, our clientele are, like, we're not in the city. We're, our population in this small town is about 16,000 year round. Oh, wow. Uh, so we don't. Wait, can, can we just pause there for a second, John? 
if you were starting a hit business and you only had you live in a small town, John's proof that you can build a successful business with a type like I I I, I complain that I live in a uh, a city a small city of a hundred thousand people here in Galway and Ireland hundred thousand and so there you go <laughs> sorry please please go whole different world um, <laughs> but yeah and it, but again you know we've had clients that have been with us since we opened our doors in 2004. So that's what, 19 years. Um, they are clearly quite content with the progress they've made. In terms of our data, which I think is what you asked me, we, I mean, we had somebody who gained 10 pounds of muscle doing I'm, I'm particularly on one and done. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify. Yeah. yeah. One, one and done. Um, well, done in one. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Hey. Uh, I have no idea how I'm going to title this episode. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, 10 pounds of lean muscle is pretty good. And I think that was over a span of a couple of months. Um, we, I mean, certainly strength in terms of measuring and the amount of weight that they're able to use through a very controlled protocol, uh, all went up for everybody. So their strength went up, their functional ability improved. Um, I, my clients aren't so fanatical about, um, aesthetics in terms of the younger client that want to lose body fat, you know, so uh, I can't speak to that really. Um, because, and again, that's primarily diet regulated anyway, there's not a protocol that's going to melt fat from your body. Um, so given that we probably had 160 people using the protocol consistently for seven months anyway, and everyone got stronger, every workout, it was. It was no different than any other protocol I employed. Uh, when we did test lean composition, uh, we found that it increased from two to 10 pounds uh, in I saw whatever that 10 week interval was roughly. Um, Would these be new people? No, they've been training with us. Well, most of our clients have been training with us for, well, in some cases for 19 years. So hang on, that some of those clients been training you for training with you for almost twenty years, started doing this protocol and gained oh, two no, to no, ten. No, yeah, no, they've been with us maybe a year or so at that. Still though, that's still great. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, again, if you're focused and you're able to recruit more fibers, you will stimulate more fibers and they will get bigger. And interesting, and I, it's just a hypothesis, is that uh, I think you when you get a lot of lactic acid, that usually is indicative that you've tapped what they call the glycolytic fibers, you know, the fast twitch fibers, which store the most glycogen and they have the most mass potential and can yield the greatest strength increases. Um, so in terms of muscle volume, that's significant. I know we've talked about this before. It's, you know, the glycogen stored within muscle bonds with water at about three grams per gram roughly. So if you burn through your glycogen, your body typically tends to overcompensate by putting more glycogen in. So the next time you come up against that wall, for whatever reason, you're running for your life, uh, you have a little more gas in the tank to get you out of that situation. But because of the, the biology of the enterprise, the muscle volume increases. And I know that a lot of people have been focusing on hypertrophy, the enlargement of fibers. I suspect that is largely a byproduct of damage, um, that it repairs itself a little thicker so that the structural integrity is greater than it was. But, uh, you know, you you have a, a finite amount of muscle fibers. They, that number doesn't change. If it does enlarge, it's going to be due to the fluid volume within the muscle. So the glycogen storage to me is, is very significant. So when you get the burn, um, you are. In heading in the right direction to increase the volume of the muscle. More so, I suspect, than uh, hypertrophy, which applies specifically to the individual fiber. Um, and it's interesting that the sheath in which the um, fiber is contained is, is also composed of fatty tissue. So anytime you have hypertrophy, you also increase the fat content. That just that goes hand in hand. I remember speaking with a woman, Dr. Barbara Hansen, who has a, specializes in primate metabolism. 
And primates are interesting because unlike rodents, they, their, their meta metabolic pathways are almost, if not identical to human uh, metabolism. And she, one of her specialties was, um, what is now called metabolic syndrome. And she was talking about how, uh, the apes and the chimpanzees also develop belly fat as they get older and they do not exercise. The older they get, they do not exercise. It's just not in their DNA to do that. Um, but that they, you know, again, that's where she said, I think she was asked a question about building muscle and she said, well, you know, that when your muscle goes up, your fat goes up because of the nature of the shell the cells and everything. And that's true. It just doesn't get discussed. And it's also one of the reasons I suspect why the studies that have been done indicate that if you're in a caloric surplus, it really doesn't matter what that, what the macro com composition is, you, you will build bigger muscles, but I suspect you're also going to build a little more fat. They also call it intramuscular fat. Is that synonymous with that basically? Or is that separate? I think that's separate. Um, this okay. is a fiber itself or the sheath within the fiber. Okay. So, I don't know. Like, like you said, it's, it's, it's learning how little we thought we knew. I mean, the, the old, the old thing was muscle is protein. So if you want more muscle, you break it down and you build it up by eating more protein, the muscle gets bigger, but there's so many other factors that go into the body of muscle that, uh, you know, protein, uh, turnover is, it's an element of it, but it, it's not the whole picture by any means. It's like picking up one grain of sand on the beach and going, that's it. That's the whole show right there. <laughs> It's not the way it is. Um, just for those listening who don't have access to the glorious Medex and Nautilus machines that you and I do, um, yes. John, and they want to do one and done or done in one at home, mm -hmm. how would you advocate they go about that? Well, exactly the same way. I mean, if you have a, most people have barbells or dumbbells. So you, you take a dumbbell that you can, or a barbell that you can adjust it preferably. Um, that you can initiate something very, very slowly out of your weakest range of motion. And it's funny, you'll find that you don't need a lot of weight for this protocol to do its job. So, um, you know, don't be too proud to reduce the weight. And in fact, uh, you know, I used to make the argument that if you're, if inroad is a big deal, if it really is the synchronome of um, uh, stimulating muscle growth, then the light of the weight, you will end up unable to move the greater the inroad. You know, if you, if at the end of your set, if you can't move 400 pounds, you might be able to move 399. But if you can't move 10 pounds, you know, that is a much deeper inroad. Now to your earlier point that maybe that necessitates a deeper inroad, a longer recovery interval. I don't know that it would depend on the individual, but. Theoretically, that would seem to be the case, but, uh, you just need a lightweight and, and do it. And if you find you misjudged and, you know, you're moving as slow as you can and move slower, if that's the case, you know, it's okay to break it into, if it's way too light, it almost imperceptibly slow that you're lifting it. Um, until you complete that repetition. And if you come down to the bottom and find. Yeah, I think I might have another one. Do it. Um, and then make necessary adjustment that you think you need to do to reduce it down closer, at least to one and done. I think this might be quite difficult with body weight, right? Like push ups, very, have to be incredibly yeah, because it could be too heavy. It could be way too yeah. heavy. I remember trying to do a done in one uh, chin up oh. <laughs> and started out gangbusters coming in my weakest position until they cut to a right angle. And it was like someone put a car on me. The only guy who, the one fellow contacted me and it was Doug, his name is Sickness. Yeah, Doug Holland, yeah. Uh, yeah. He was a, he has like freakish police. Yeah, he's a legend. He's been on podcasts a bunch of times. Yeah. yeah and he, he sent me a video clip. He goes, hey, I did your done in one. <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> And it was, yeah, that was Pro pr probably weighted as well. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. But uh, 
that's the kind of strength again speak genetics it's the kind of strength this guy's got you know and uh, but i think he did it just to show me that hey here's what a chin up looks like kind of done in one and it was like wow that was that was, that was, he is an inspiration I, I guess um i was just thinking about it um i think yeah, there's an old school body by science video with v ferguson who actually i think does a similar protocol it might not be a done in one it might just be like a super slow chin but it's like pretty impressive from memory um and I was just thinking, this could work, obviously, again, requires massive amount of discipline and focus, but this could work well for like lower body, you know, like a bodyweight squat. You could do this yeah. kind of thing quite well. That could work because, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to find yeah. that, you know, are stronger than our body muscles in that case. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I mean, you, you can make adjustments. You don't have to do a, I mean, you could probably do a push up that way. Most people could. Or if not, you could do a, you know, a knee push up. Um, and body weight squat would work. Um, I prefer movements that are over a very large range of motion um, because it allows the leverage factors to fatigue the muscle at a more rapid rate. So you don't need a lot of weight. Um, and and some, like I say, chin ups, that's a tough one because uh, uh, by the time you're out of the weakest position, You've pretty much cycled through all the available fibers. Look, they're dug. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No more soldiers left on the battlefield. That's a beautiful metaphor that you yeah. used. You, you're, you're the metaphor analogy master, John. If I uh, if I can work that that muscle uh, to the to the standard you have with those, I, I'll be very happy one day. Um. So so last question, and then we'll wrap because um, I was getting towards time here. Um. If uh, listeners could take one key piece of advice from this conversation about one and done or done in one, what would you want that to be? What would be your final thought on this? Um, well, just to try it, um, but don't feel that you're morally and legally bound to use it for the rest of your life. You know, it's, uh, it's an effective protocol for the reasons we've touched upon. Um, but it claims a special status. It's, uh, it's not ultimate training protocol. If such an animal exists, it's not, uh, uh going to produce results that, um, uh, are un unobtainable wise, um, your results are going to be genetically mediated. Um, your gains to some extent will be genetically mediated. The, the key is it'll do everything that a thorough, safe exercise pro should and will stimulate whatever adaptive ability your muscles possess. But in that respect, it's, you know, it's no more or less effective than any other protocol. It's just one that has been engineered to try and mitigate some of the negative components of conventional exercise. Yeah, well said. Thank you, John. This has been a great episode. Um, I'm excited. This is the the masterclass, the seminal episode on done in one or one and done on the internet, that, at least that I'm aware of, um, until until John obviously writes a book about it. So uh, as we wrap here, John, uh, just... You can, uh, maybe you can uh, run a contest, name the protocol. So <laughs> I'm floundering as to what the hell it's called. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Um, and also, I think we should encourage the listeners to uh, send in a clip or just upload to YouTube and email us a clip of them doing a, a, a done in one bodyweight squat because I'd love to see that because that, that, takes, be good, that, that takes a unique animal to do this. <laughs> um, What's Doug the, the beast, the Satan's? Doug Hall, um, he could probably do it to be fair. Yeah, he could probably do it for a week and a half. <laughs> So um, before we got recording, you were speaking, obviously, about the work you're doing um, on the YouTube channel, releasing lots of the Mike Mensa stuff, which sounds so exciting. And obviously, my listener base would love that. And I'm sure already tuning in. I actually saw a whole bunch of it come up on my YouTube. So I, I'm, I'm assuming yeah. it's it's already in it. Yeah, I mean, look, you've got a good base of subscribers now. Um, so it's coming up for me. I'm sure it's coming up for a lot of our colleagues and a lot of our um, contemporaries. So how can people find that channel? What's the, what's the URL or the, the name? Or to be honest, I don't have a, That's a to remember. To, don't worry. What's the name? Yeah. It's heavy duty college, HDC. 
And uh, because I always felt that anytime you spent time with Mike, you learned something, whether it was philosophy, his thoughts on nutrition, his thoughts on exercise, his thoughts on recovery. So I just thought I didn't want to brand it, um, you know, with big muscles because there's so much more to Mike. So yeah, if you been heavy duty college, then we'll take you there. Heavy duty college. I love that name. I'll definitely link that as well. So if, yeah, so that'll be obviously linked from the show notes. And um, John, what about the rest of your work, your books? What's the best place to send people there? Is it the Amazon profile or is it somewhere else? Amazon carries pretty much every book I've ever written. So uh, that's the safest one. Uh, can, go do it. can you, can you just, yeah, no, sorry to cut you off. Um, can you just remind us that you were telling me some of the books you've um, been working on recently or, or recently published the Bruce Lee stuff? Can you just touch on that? Because I think that'd be really fascinating to people. Uh, well, over the past... Two years, I guess, I've uh, got two books, one of which is a two-volume series. One is, uh, it's called The Donnellys, and it was a true crime, a murder, a family that was wiped out by some neighbors here in Canada in the 1880s. Fascinating story. Um, at least it was for me. I grew up with it. And it was just, they were just a tough Irish family who, who wanted just to be left the hell alone. And, uh, for religious reasons and for, uh, envy and other, uh, reasons that wasn't going to happen. The, this Donnelly family, they refused to take the backward step. Every one of the sons was tough as nails and strong and muscular and could fight. And they did. And consequently, the, there was a, a lot of the other people in the farming community that were a little concerned about. So one night. When the Darleys were sleeping, a mob went over there and set fire in the house and beat them to death uh, with clubs and pitchforks and all that sort of stuff. It was a horrific uh, crime that the headlines went all across North America. And, and uh, I, I was always intrigued by it. I was like, how could this have happened? And I, and I was able to go through, it took me two years, but to go through all of the material in the letters and diary entries and newspaper reports and court transcripts. I was finally able to piece together sort of how this went down and uh, how the brothers, the surviving brothers dealt with it. There there were, uh, there was a coroner's inquest and two trials that followed. And there was two eyewitnesses to the murders. And despite that, the jury, which were composed mainly of the relatives of vigilantes who killed these people, acquitted them. So it was a, it was terrible tragedy, but it was a fascinating story. And then the other book I did was one of Bruce Lee's real fights. There has been a lot of uh, conjecture oh, yeah. that he died that, well, yeah, he looked good in the movies, you know, real life. He never fought in tournaments. He never, you know, he was a paper tiger or paper dragon, I guess in his case. And, uh, you know, I just thought, you know, that isn't really true. And, and it initially. I mean, even before I did any research, it was pretty obvious that anyone that had that kind of timing, rhythm, versatility, speed, power, uh, these attributes wouldn't evaporate in a real fight. And when I dug into it, I found out, yeah, he did. He had a lot of fights and he was very good. And, uh, if any, he was probably more lethal in real life than he was on the screen. Wow. For example, typical fight where Bruce fights a black belt in a movie. There's a bit of give and take, you know, the black belt gets in a few builds up the drama, Bruce comes back and it lasts about four and a half minutes in real life. He took a black belt 11 seconds. That's how good it was. So that's the spark. And then on, I probably will tackle a biography on Mike Metzer and that'll be a very personal project. And it's one that, uh, I, I have some trepidation about tackling, but I think a story needs to be told. I think the marketplace has been littered with his, the comments and the words, uh, of his adversaries and it, like all of my books, it'll, this will be heavily sourced. Uh, so it will be definitive when, and if I do it. Just one more question on that. Um, would you have to get like permission from family or from him or, or would you get seek no, the counsel I, at all? Or how does that work? I would seek the counsel. Yeah, definitely. For, for accuracy, you would, sure. I would want 
But in terms of legalities, uh, Mike was a public figure, so anybody can write a book about it. Uh, okay. That's fine. Um, but yeah, no, I, there's, I mean, there's areas I want to explore that I would require uh, clearance in certain areas, and only the family could provide that. So the thing is, you know, Mike's story is, um, I, I suspect, is sort of like that Russell Crowe film, A Beautiful Mind. You know, uh, uh, this was a guy that reached the very summit of bodybuilding and then had one hell of a fall. Uh, and yet, through the power of his mind, was able to redeem himself in terms of pulling himself out of that and uh, create an approach to training and a, a refined, completely refined intensity program. But up until Mike started training people one-on-one, -on -one, flipboard in hand, there were no intensity trainers. So he was the template. He was the first one that did what we all do now. Um, and, and, you know, he doesn't really get recognized for, but, you know, all of us, uh, we're the footnotes to what he, he did. He was the guy, you know, so he's the patron saint of high, high intensity training and some will acknowledge him, but you know, it's, it's funny to, to me, um, Mike is his own best spokesperson. So when I do the videos that appear on this channel, I'm not appearing, I'm not talking. People don't want to hear about what I think on these topics. I want to hear guys. You're very modest. I got that because I'm that way. If someone did a Mike Menzer channel, like you want to say, hey, Bob Smith, I wouldn't watch it, you know? Um, but there are lots of people in the high intensity community that um, will reference Mike, but then it's a and then what they're going to do. It's the usual pitch. And the thing is, that's fine. It's well and good. And it's the way it ought to be. Uh, you know, people who are interested in it and are working with it and developing it and training people uh, develop a certain level of expertise that they should train them. And I have absolutely no problem with that. Um, but, uh, you know, don't forget who brought you to the dance, you know. And uh, Mike was the guy, again, this all, he's his own best spokesman. When he came out in the seventies, people were fascinated. Then he disappeared. Then he came back in the nineties. People were fascinated all over again. And then he died. And I'd say for the past 20 years, 21 years, 22 years, no one has filled the void that he's, left. there's no shortage of trainers that mushroomed up everywhere, but no one has, has had that total package of mind and body yeah. and philosophy. Uh, um, that was as for amazing that Mike did. I'll, I'll McGuff. Never forget. Doug well, McGuff. Doug McGuff is uh, he he he's he's he has the scientific mind for sure, and he knows training, and he has a good physique. But you know, it does, it's not Mike's physique. I mean, this sure. guy that's but at the very no offense, Doug. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> but it was, I mean. You look at a picture of Mike Menzer when he was 15 years old, he looks better than any one of us ever did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was, he just had the genetics. Uh, he had that uniform muscle fiber density, long muscle bellies, and just about every muscle group in his body uh, uh, when he was a kid. And so when that was married with resistance training and later on with steroid, it, was, it produced this physique that was worthy, certainly at the very least, to stand on stage next to an Arnold Schwarzenegger and, um, and cause people to say that Mike should have won the comparison, you know, uh, many years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just on, just on Doug quickly, uh, obviously met, met Doug in person, Doug McGuff, this is, um, I want to say it was rec 2019, uh, REC resistance exercise conference. And it was such a, amazing for me because a lot of the, the speakers who come to, to rec, maybe they're not, you know, part of the hit movement or maybe they are, um, won't do the early morning workout, but the early morning workout really is the, the crucible, John. And have, have you ever done that? Have you ever been to rec? Forgive me. I, I'm not sure if you had. No. So it's just, you know, it's just. He's so track. He tried to get to go this year. So we should rent a table and we can go there. And I just, you know, I don't want to. Minneapolis, I think it was this year. Minnesota. It was in the Too chilly. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, f fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's uh, it's a great event, but the point I was trying to make is, um, 
it was really great for me to see and for everyone to see Doug do the early morning workout because I think a lot of people just opt out of it, right? And he was like, no, no, I'll do the workout. And he's there and he he was doing like, um you know, some lower body exercises. And I was like, geez, you are in good, Nick. You are yeah. looking good, you know? So, so, fe- so he walks the walk big time. Great shape his legs are really impressive. Actually, I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Shredded. Remember he and I in uh, uh, Fiji been taken out there with Tony Robbins. And uh, it's the first time I met Doug actually was there. When we did the book, it was all over the phone. I never met him face to face. So we came face to face in Fiji and he was wearing shorts. And I thought, holy crap. You know, and I said to him, I said, those are the the high, the uh, body by science legs, are they? He goes, well, actually. <laughs> So there, I said, is that from BMX? He said, no, he said BMX was because of the genetics of the legs. So, yeah. Uh, wow. You know, Doug's a great guy and, and incredibly knowledgeable. And, uh, you know, to me in the present climate, uh, bringing my message from the mix, I, to me, Doug is the authority, um, on all matters, high intensity, um, and, and training generally. So nothing but massive respect for Doug McGuff. And, uh, uh, I, I, I mean, it's one of the reasons I, I sought him out for an interview in Iron, which, uh, then led to us doing the book. I thought people need to hear from this guy because he is significant. You know? We're so, we're so thankful you did because, you know, the book has been so impactful. Sorry, John, I know we need to wrap up well after this point. Um, it's been so impactful and. You know, it's it's the syllabus for a lot of our studio owners. You know, we 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 have it as part of our you know growth plans for trainers. And you know, in my inside my my you know paid membership, we've got a you know a multiple choice quiz that people can repurpose in their business, so that so that when a trainer reads the book, they do the quiz to retain the information. Because if you don't do the quiz, you know, it's likely to retain it and it's less useful in terms of actually like you know using the information practically. Yeah. And uh, that is on Doug, you know, um, yeah. I, I just thought that we needed at that point, I could died and I thought we need a voice of science here, like a legit voice of science that knows. I mean, Doug every day with no exaggeration has people's in his hand. So he, I mean, there's nobody, nobody that compares with his knowledge, uh, medically and anatomically and mm-hmm. physiologically in the high intensity community or the change uh, so we're fortunate a that he's in the community to begin with and b that he uh, has endorsed uh an approach to training that we all hold near and dear to us so yeah doug is doug's absolutely the the best possible spokesperson for high intensity training yeah and he's coming back on the show soon. So excited to uh, have him back in the next uh, couple Tell of months. I was pipe just there. Tell him I was making stuff up. He's absolutely off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know. Um, so, so lastly, uh, obviously check out John's Hit Uni course, uh, John Little's six minute hit. You get 10% off when you go to hituni.com and use the coupon code HIB10 during checkout. Um, John. More, more importantly than my six minute hit uni course is that I've spoken with uh, Simon, who, of course, runs Hit Uni. Sure. And we're, we're going to do one on Mike Benson. Oh, so wow. I'm really, really excited about that because it That'd be amazing. gives him the credit that he's due. So uh, look for that uh, more so than my own. That is amazing. I am looking forward to um, publishing that. That would be great. Um, and again, for everyone listening, please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. It takes less than 10 seconds. It really helps the podcast grow. Um, and obviously help more people learn about high intensity training and transform people's lives and also help them build a hit business too, if that's what they want to do. Um, and yeah, to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search episode 417. And again, to get more clients for your high intensity training business, download the free anti-aging and strength training sales presentation, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash free. That's F-R-E-E. And you also get access to tons more resources. John, I'm so thankful for your time. It's been amazing as always. And um, hopefully we can do it again soon. Great speaking to you, Lawrence. You be well. You too, John. Take care.